This week on Africa Weekly, we return to Burundi where confusion reigns after an attempt to overthrow President Pierre Nkurunziza ended in failure. We set sail with the Tunisian Coast Guards on the lookout for migrants making the deadly crossing to Europe. Then we head to Botswana, where elephants are becoming both a source of revenue for the country and a scourge for farmers. And finally, we meet the young skateboarders of Addis Ababa, rising above the capital's crises. But first, the top stories that made the headlines this week. There was euphoria on the streets of Bujumbura on Wednesday when an army general announced the overthrow of President Pierre Nkurunziza after weeks of protests, denouncing the president's bid to seek a third term in power. But after 48 hours of uncertainty over who was leading the country, the coup leaders admitted defeat, leaving a trail of confusion on the streets of the capital. Grenades, rifles, we heard a lot of noise. But so far we don't know what happened. More than 25 people have been killed and scores wounded since clashes erupted in late April between police and protesters, with the UN reporting that 100,000 Burundians have since fled to neighboring countries. In South Africa, Musi Maimani became the first black man to be elected to head the traditionally white Democratic Alliance Party. It's a move that may widen the appeal of the country's main opposition party, which currently lags far behind the ruling ANC, in power for over two decades. past still remains with us today. Finally in Liberia, thousands celebrated the end of Ebola after the country was officially given the all-clear from an epidemic that has killed more than 4,700 people. Liberians have even gone back to the beach, a luxury that had so far been banned to prevent the spread of the disease. The World Health Organization is urging people to remain vigilant as the virus is still present in neighboring Guinea and Sierra Leone. On Wednesday, the EU unveiled a plan for dealing with an unprecedented wave of migrants, including controversial plans for binding quotas across member states. Meanwhile, for Tunisian coast guards, like those monitoring other Mediterranean countries, controlling the flow of migrants remains a challenge. Scanning the waters for migrants in distress. These days, that's one of the main jobs for the Tunisian coast guard. A lack of resources, coupled with more people trying to cross the Mediterranean as the weather clears up, means they're struggling to keep pace. They even have to rely on fishermen to help with rescue missions. It's normal that in some cases it's the fishermen who intercept the migrants, because there are hundreds of fishing boats in international waters, so they outnumber us. But that doesn't stop us from being there with all the other security forces, and we intervene whenever necessary. With neighboring Libya, another popular departure point, now in a state of chaos, the number of African and Middle Eastern migrants venturing into Tunisian waters is increasing. 366 alone were rescued in April. Some are now housed here by the Red Crescent, but with a boat full of migrants arriving almost every other day, space is at a premium. We have a limited capacity, so we cannot take on too many people. Our number of volunteers is limited, our means are limited, and from what I've seen, the means of the state are limited too. We need more support from humanitarian organizations. Ali Kone left his home in Ivory Coast nine months ago. He's already traveled through Mali, Algeria and Libya. He then tried to cross from Tunisia on a cramped inflatable motorboat, along with 96 others. We had a serious problem at sea off the Tunisian coast. After we passed the Libyan coast and we made it to the coast here, everything went wrong. The boat was pierced and it started to deflate, but then we saw the fisherman's boat. We called them and they rescued us. Rescued migrants often attempt the trip again. In 2014, more than 220,000 of them reached their destination, according to the EU. And despite the hundreds of deaths already reported, many more look set to take on the sea for a better life in Europe, meaning more busy days ahead for the Tunisian Coast Guard. No harvest for Minsozi. Elephants have destroyed her field and eaten all the corn. 
It is a recurring issue for the people of Mabele in north of Botswana where elephants roam free. Her village is located on the edge of Chobe National Park and according to Minsozi, the situation deteriorated when the government banned hunting in January 2014. During previous seasons, I was able to harvest my crops because the elephants were killed. But this year, due to the hunting ban, I can't harvest anything because elephants have destroyed my crops. I'm so stressed, I don't know how my children and I are going to survive. My husband's salary is not enough. Before 2014, regulated hunting was allowed. Local communities were given a quota of animals, including elephants and buffaloes, that could be shot. The villagers would sell hunting licenses to specialist companies, bringing in tens of thousands of dollars to the community. In many places, tourism, which is the tourism as in photographic tourism, which is the obvious uh, alternative, doesn't quite work either because you have low densities of, uh, of or relatively low densities of wildlife, but yet important populations over a large area, or because you have uh, disease or poor infrastructure, etc. So hunting is an option that is available to all to all governments, and, and many of them use it quite successfully. And Botswana did for quite a few years. Botswana is home to a third of all African elephants. Its national parks and private reserves make tourism the country's most profitable industry, second only to diamond mining. The government wants the profits of tourism to benefit everyone without killing the animals. The hunters only employ people during the hunting season. That's consumptive. Non-consumptive is throughout the year. So that is why we prefer the non-consumptive. Also, it looks after the species that we have. Once the source of much-needed income, elephants are now becoming a major nuisance to some villagers in Botswana. Now the community, we used to tell them that conserve so that you get the profits. But now it's not easy to change the mindset and say conserve. Conserve for what? In Botswana, held for its successes in conservation, this debate largely hinges on business rather than moral discussion on animal rights. Even tourist guides fear that the hunting ban will drive desperate villagers into indiscriminate killing. Skateboarding in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa is not easy, but the city's potholed roads and clogged traffic are no deterrent for these young skaters. Yeah, we're just trying to use whatever it is in Addis. Even if the spots are pretty bad, we just make the best out of it. In Shiro Maida, a poor neighborhood in the hills above the city, the sport is offering moments of fun and escape for young people living there. A non-profit group called Mugabe Skate is helping them learn with lessons and building this ramp so the boys and girls can spend their free time honing their skills. Skateboards are hard to come by in Ethiopia, but the growing number of fans have attracted the support of skateboarders worldwide, who have donated dozens of boards, enabling more children to give the once unknown sport a go. So like, as soon as they see this sport, a new sport, that people didn't, like, uh, you know, you can't picture that in Africa, they, they're amazed and they're happy to see it here. So it's pretty amazing, yeah. Every Saturday, the young skaters are encouraged to put down their boards and do something worthwhile for the wider community to help a single mother or do some cleaning and to show that even skating daredevils can also have big hearts. In sport, Ethiopian legend Haile Gebrselassie announced his retirement from competitive running on Sunday following a career spanning 25 years. The 42-year-old leaves the race with 27 world records. Next week, we'll go to Namibia, where the introduction of a new minimum wage for domestic workers could turn around the lives of some of the country's worst paid employees. And we will meet a couple of the founders of Afrobeat, who have been mixing music with their political beliefs. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week.